you know, if you take one thing away from this talk, it's that if we're all turning into data-driven companies, if we really believe that that's what people value, then you, we've got to start thinking about data as an asset to our business, not as a cost. And so, you know, that starts by saying, hey, let's stop throwing data away. Let's make it available to more of the users in our organizations. And let's arm them with more uh, data processing technologies, right? Now, that sounds good, but it's actually super hard. So, because there's a lot more data than people think. What, you know, I've been in this business for a long time, and my estimate is that data is growing about 10x every five years. That's across industries and so on. And when you're making a data replatforming decision, in general, that decision is uh, valid for about 15 years. And people often argue with me about it and then ask them, hey, you're moving away from, let's say, Teradata. Um, when did you make that decision to move on to it? And it's right in there. And, uh, you know, how much has your data grown over the past 15 years? And so I think, you know, it's one of these things where people can predict the past really easily, but they can't really predict the future very well, and they somehow think things level out. And at least to date, over the last 30 years, it hasn't. And the point of that is, is that if you multiply the 15 years with the 10x growth every five years, that means your platform decision needs to scale 1,000x from where it is today. If you've got a petabyte today, you're going to have an exabyte in 15 years. If you've got a terabyte today, you're going to have a petabyte uh, in uh, 15 years. Second problem is that there are more ways to analyze data than ever before. Hadoop wasn't a thing 15, uh, 11 years ago. Elasticsearch wasn't a thing eight years ago. Presto wasn't a thing five years ago. And uh, Spark wasn't a thing four years ago. Now, think about how important those are as part of your data processing ecosystems today, right? So that's interesting because the innovation in data processing engine is almost something you need to defend against or in other words, you know, sort of architect your way to be able to support what's coming in the future, right? And then there's this third issue where, you know, we all want to democratize data and we all want to make it available to more users. And at the very same time, we want to limit access because that's how we get compliance, that's how we get audit, that's how we ensure security, right? So that's pretty challenging, all three. And that's one of the things that's driving people to data lakes. Sorry, this thing is going to build for a while. Let me just keep going. Um, okay, I'm going to assume that it stops here. Because what data lakes let you do is already today you can support exabytes of data. And it separates the notion of where you store data and how you transform data from how you um, access it and how you manipulate it, right? So you load it, transform it, and catalog it once. The data is available to a multitude of tools. And the second key point I'd ask you to take away from this talk is, is that you really have to use, rely on open formats and open APIs because I don't know what the next great tool that's going to be out there is. I'm pretty sure it's going to support Parquet or ORC or you know, JSON or whatever. It's not necessarily going to support whatever random you know, like binary format that is highly optimized inside some other tool. Right? That's a path to lock in. So uh, Andy announced uh, lake formation uh, earlier today. You can sign up for the preview. Small ad there. And there are basically three components to lake formation. First, we have a bunch of blueprints that help you uh, build and transform and deploy your data. You know, uh, we have a bunch of security policies so that your security can be applied on the data lake itself, uh, not on the access paths into the lake. And that's another thing that's necessary. One of the reasons people are kind of stuck in their data warehouses today is that uh, that's where their centralized security is, that's where their centralized catalog is, and so forth. So my view is, is that at least for the next 15 years, data lakes are the new um, data warehouse, 
and data warehouses are the new data marts, right? So you're going to be doing subject-based analysis there. And so that means that you need to control your data and do the auditing and so forth near the center. And so what we're doing is, is we're generating, we're inside our catalog, we, you know, we allow you to define policies, including based on um, tags like PCI, PII, et cetera. And um, then at that point, you can say, like, UNRWA is allowed access to PII data, but only for his employees, right? And uh, so on. Um, and then that policy is applied across all of the tools that access. Because what we're doing is, is we're wrapping the surveys that access to basically filter out the rows and columns you're not allowed to see. And uh, we're, at, we're also doing that uh, using a JDBC driver or ODBC driver for your SQL based access. So, you know, just basically being in that query path gives us the ability to control the access as well as audit, as well as do things like data masking and pseudo nominization and so forth over time. So we're pretty excited about it. It's, um, you know, obviously it's a service that gets better over time as we improve. The last uh, big portion is that as data gets bigger, it becomes very hard for humans to manipulate it, right? And so one of the biggest problems there is cleansing your data. So we're really moving towards a machine learning based approach, starting with uh, deduplication of data and record linkage between data. But, you know, that's again going to expand as time progresses. So, so how that works, it's basically saying the same thing. You know, to build data quickly, you know, we're trying to identify, crawl, and catalog your sources, you know, and uh, do that more dynamically and using machines, right? I mean, no one's sitting there, you know, like the difference between old, old scale uh, school Yahoo and Google was that Google crawled while Yahoo had a bunch of editors defining that uh, directory structure. And then the data got too big and you know, one clearly ate the other. Um, and then also to ingest the cleanse the data and transform it into optimal formats behind the scenes based on access. Um, we talked about uh, security management, enforcing encryption, defining access policies. policies. And if we can, uh, we're in the path for all of the accesses we can clearly audit, uh, you know, regardless of what tool you're using. And um, we're really interested in providing a, a self-discovery uh, environment so you can just use a search mechanism to find what data is where. Okay. And that uh, sort of gives you, uh, you know, sort of a screen grab of what our database analytics and now blockchain uh, picture looks like. And you know, it's looking at that rough layer cake, it's you know, data movement at the bottom, the uh, storage and lake uh, capabilities in the middle. Uh, glue is an important part of that, both for ETL and for cataloging. And then. Um, a variety of different databases and analytic tools and blockchain capabilities and be next there, step there. And then above that, we also think of uh, AI ML as a core part of your data architecture. Unless you get the lower layers clean, it's very hard to do anything with automated reasoning. And you know, those are our tools on the side. On the other side, you can see that you know, we're retailers at heart, we believe in you know, selection, we believe in low prices, we believe in fast delivery. So, um, you know, that carries over to AWS as well. And you know, in this particular case, you'll see that there are a ton of marketplace offerings in each of these areas as well. 